As everybody knows, an Englishman loves England, his family, his weekends, his cup of tea, his queen, but above all, animals. And of all the animals, dogs are those which the 48 million British subjects love best. They are the most privileged, the most pampered, and the best protected by law. The first Mondo Cane was forbidden in England because of some sequences in which dogs were the victims of man's cruelty. We reverently bow before the judgment of the British Board of Film Censors, and to show that we have learned our lesson, today we respectfully offer you the second version, almost without blood and without cruelty. This sequence, in fact, is one of the few exceptions. It was shot in a London clinic where every day numbers of dogs have their vocal cords cut so that their howls will not disturb the surgeons as they carry out their experiments in vivisection. We put this scene at the beginning of the film so that the British censors can, if they think fit, use their surgeon's scalpel here. With a clean cut here, they can amputate this scene without making the dogs or our producers howl. must admit that a dog's life in Italy is much more frivolous and offers fewer satisfactions. So whilst in England dogs are called upon to collaborate in the progress of science, here in Italy they have to be content with making their contribution to fashion. Emilio Federico Schubert, the famous Roman dress designer, has decreed that this year with a striped dress a striped dog is essential, whilst with a spotted dress you must have a spotted dog. Naturally, a dress designer can't give a dog the same satisfaction as a surgeon, but still a dog can't always have the privilege of making the supreme sacrifice. Sometimes he must just be satisfied with sacrificing his coat. To lose one's hair at Sant'Antimo in the province of Aversa is really good luck. Now that wigs are in fashion again, hair costs up to two pounds, six shillings a pound. It is a source of wealth that until now the women of the depressed areas of southern Italy never realized they had. demand, not only for tresses, but even for combings, today make Aversa the best groomed province in the whole of Italy, if not in the whole world. It is prime quality hair, which is in great demand on the American market because of its particular pliancy, due, it seems, to having grown on scalps which are badly nourished and therefore suffer from serious vitamin deficiency. Nowhere but in Sant'Antimo, where a woman is worth more than a sheep, has the economic boom struck with such force.
washed, scoured, carded, boiled, ironed, bleached and then dyed, the hair from Sant'Antimo arrives here, in one of America's beauty parlors, in the department for the maintenance of spare parts for the female clientele. In America, where women have careers, a wig isn't a luxury, it's a social necessity. The American woman has no time to waste at the hairdressers. At the most, she can send her head, but the rest of her must stay and work in the office. clock in any office. At the same time, all over America, 24,000 working girls put on their wigs like one woman, anxious to find themselves once more and as quickly as possible with all the unmistakable signs of their sex. Of the $8 million worth of hair that the United States import from Italy each year, only the very smallest part is dedicated to the poor, worn-out old scalps of the rich widows. The biggest lot ends up on the heads of these anonymous American Medusae. example of the professional use of the wig. In hundreds of nightclubs, the shorn tresses of the merry wives of Sant'Antimo are the most important element in the fakery of these professional fakers. Je vous chante l'amour et la vie. Je désire l'amour pour toi, pour moi, et demande-moi l'amour avec la vie. Since pretty Coxinelle has given way to the paternal instinct and has married a nice boy from the provinces, the genuine product is in short supply. All one can do is to turn to the unemployed, to bankrupt tradesmen and even the odd colonel, retired of course. Naturally, they all have something in their turbid past, uh, like a part as Ophelia in the school play, or one of the ugly sisters in Cinderella. their job is a shameful secret. At home, the wife knows, but not the children. this female impersonator lark can be a manly gesture. Scenes like this are quite frequent in the police stations of many American cities plagued with sadists and sexual maniacs. Barbered, padded, plucked, painted, powdered and perfumed, these pretty policemen will act as bait on park benches or by the lampposts of the ill-famed streets. It seems impossible. 
but just by walking the streets they pick up between four and six sadists per night, who, of course, as soon as they plunge their hands among the frills and flounces, find a hard nut to crack. marginal statistic. Each one of these beauty queens gets about 30 serious proposals from sexually normal individuals every evening, and this makes them very, very annoyed. Mexican policemen get annoyed too when they miss the mark, and in that precise instant, someone goes to his maker. It doesn't often happen, but it does sometimes. The fact is that the Mexicans have a rather unusual conception of death. Look how they celebrate the 2nd of November. Human skulls made of sugar and filled with creme chantilly, which of all fillings is that which most resembles brains. The children all ask for los cadaveres del tío Judas, the corpses of Uncle Judas, life-size marzipan figures in the unpleasant likeness of the traitor, just as he was cut down from the fig tree. Like all those who have died a violent death, Judas has undergone an autopsy, so we can admire the appetizing mess of giblets through the long incision in his abdomen. Heart, liver and lights, pancreas and kidneys sell like hotcakes, and even the tougher parts of the old rascal are devoured by the famished population. Mexico loves and respects its dead and hates Judas, who is a disgrace to the category. With this ancient rite of November the 2nd, they try to get rid of him, an unpleasant neighbor, in an undoubtedly reasonable way. Just as reasonable as the Mexican system for getting rid of parasites. These are insects which do a great deal of damage to the crops. The Mexicans prefer them alive, wrapped in tortillas with hot sauce. A good squeeze before taking the first bite makes the bugs give off that typical smell which makes it all so much more appetizing.
but the importance of the insect in the economic life of the country is not limited to the sector of food alone. Some well-known jewelers in Mexico have recently started the fashion of the evening bug by covering them with little shells of gold or platinum covered with precious stones. In this case, too, a caress with the finger makes the bug give off the usual penetrating odor, which makes it all so much more fascinating. But after all, the fashion of decorating decorative animals isn't new. In New York, for example, there are jewelers who are specialized in jewels for dogs, where women's most faithful friends can find a collar, a lead, and even a pair of earrings for the modest sum of $20,000. But we must say at this point that the American woman has a very particular affection for her dog. Among the classified advertisements in the New York Times, in fact, it isn't unusual to find announcements of this kind. Black Poodle, lost in the neighborhood of Park Avenue. $5,000 reward for the return of at least the collar. of flowers at Honolulu for only $5,000, states another advertisement in the same paper, and promises for that sum 10 wild days in the sunshine of that magic island that restores lost youth and vigor. Beside a geezer of radioactive mud, the barker is translating an ancient native proverb. Aloha, Atema, ha ha. According to what the barker says, a literal translation of the proverb would be, after the first half century of splendor, sometimes the white woman finds that her skin is just the tiniest bit wrinkled. Not to worry, for a total of only $65, taxes included, the volcanic radioactive mud of this ardent island will work a miracle, and the gleaming whiteness of her skin will once more dazzle the astonished eyes of her lovers. Aloha, Atema, aha. different kind of mud is mixed by the Maasai women in these villages. It is that organic, sticky mud which is so offensive. In other words, manure. Here it is fuel, building material, disinfectant, laxative, plaster for broken legs, and lastly it is spread on the roofs of the huts, and in the evening it gives off a certain aphrodisiac perfume that encourages and stimulates the activity of the husbands. the wives. Here they are, eating stones. Little white stones which they find on the beds of the dry water courses and which they wash down with sips of water. 
They say that just one of these little white pebbles swallowed at the rising of the new moon has the power of making them sterile for a month. We were saying that just one of these stones is enough to make them sterile. But when the men go off on hunting expeditions and leave their wives in the odorous villages, new moon or not, the women rush down to the valley and gorge themselves with stones. After all, one swallow doesn't make a summer. On the other hand, the women of New Guinea have to solve the opposite problem. And if they want to find a husband, they must first prove that they are capable of bearing at least one child. So after a period of pre-matrimonial running in, which obviously can't be less than nine months, during a lively cocktail party, these charming little bastards can at last get to know mummy's official fiancé. more than in any other country in the world, call houses are obliged to make themselves obvious. Continually on the run from one address to another, a house of assignation can never give anyone an assignation. In fact, you can never call a call girl because you never know which number to call. So without the moral support of the telephone, the call girls play solitaire. In America, there's nothing sadder than a gay lady. Provincial Don Giovannis have no talent for original sin, or worse, they have no original talent for sin. Conjugal tenderness is a woman's task in America. The erotic energy necessary for the propagation of the species produced by huge demonstrations of beauty and sex appeal is nationalized. The mass of users is not permitted to consume the product casually. The supply passes through automatic meters which are opened only on Saturdays and Sundays or on public holidays and benefits. Here, for example, is a benefit. As you know, the latest fashions from Paris overlook the hat completely. As a consequence, the millinery industry in the United States is in a critical condition. Society women got to hear of this, got organized, got moving, and held a demonstration. Here they are, walking about in hats that, although they don't encourage the industry, certainly draw one's attention to the gravity of the situation. with the precipitation of a crisis, sex gets organized too. Rhythmets and majorettes prance and strut on the stage of the committee of the Save the Hat Week, whilst some girls chosen from the best families in town sell kisses to help the families of unemployed milliners. One kiss, five dollars. Three kisses, nine dollars, ninety-five.
guaranteed and, above all, sanitized for your protection kisses. One kiss, five dollars. Three kisses, nine dollars, ninety-five. What is a kiss? A rose-colored parenthesis between dollars. And what is a parenthesis? Two dollars wrapped round the word love. And what is love? A dollar with a capital D. frequented by men only on the days their wives are saving hats. It's a sort of wailing wall for lunch widowers, a long wall full of urns. On each urn there is an epitaph which describes the food which is buried there. You can try to identify the food through the little glass windows, but it's unwise. Beside each crib there is a slot where you insert a coin. It's where you put flowers in the normal way. After which, if you've chosen steak, you find yourself with a slice of apple pie. Supplied free of charge as a scalpel and a little paper shroud. This is an automatic toll road. Do you want to go to Los Angeles, for example? Just put a coin in the slot and thank you, in a flash you find yourself in the morgue. It's rush hour, 10 automobiles per second on six lanes. 600 automobiles a minute, minimum permitted speed, 50 miles per hour. Seven road signs in 100 yards, 123 and one half road signs every mile. One killed and four injured every 10 miles. 10 killed and 40 injured every 10 hours over 100 miles. Statistics concerning hysteria and madness after 24 hours driving in this hell are not available. We must admit, however, that today America has a good safety valve for hysteria and madness. In the quiet motels just off the main roads at nodal points, more and more of these little cinemas are to be found. Here, the driver can relive on the screen the incidents of the day's journey while his resentment is still fresh and let off steam in certain reactions that the traffic cops might consider, well, rude. They are psychological decompression chambers, where for $1.50 the driver has the right to a front seat and six pounds of bad tomatoes, the amount the psychiatrist considers sufficient for a satisfactory decompression. Collective hysteria of this crowd, their writhing and screaming in this deconsecrated church in the Cilente region of southern Italy, certainly can't be attributed to the traffic in this forgotten little village, hidden away in a valley that has been asleep for centuries. Scientists and the fantasy of laymen have given many names to this affliction, some learned and some picturesque. They have tried to discover its causes with scientific methods and with the occult resources of black magic. These people, science calls tremory and attributes their condition to a lack of certain particular proteins. The popular name for them is tarantulati, or that is to say, those bitten by the tarantula spider, since the tarantula in southern Italy is the incarnation of the devil. But whether it is the fault of the proteins, the devil or the tarantula spider, here they are in their agony, their mad fear, their impotent fury. What are they shouting? Nothing that can possibly have any sense. What are they asking for? Nothing that any human being could possibly give them. What then does their periodic madness seek to express? Nothing more than the universal madness of hate, love, adoration, the will to kill, the desire to blaspheme or to pray.
pathetic in his madness or tragic in his humility, man is always a timid actor who makes a performance of his dismay. And when he mortifies his flesh in a performance that even the church deplores, he awaits with desperate anxiety the applause of heaven. Shira di Franca in Portugal, an act of absurd humility has for years defied the bishop's veto. The image of a saint will soon climb these steps which the faithful are washing with their bleeding tongues. Saturday morning in the church of the village of Coculo in Abruzzo, hundreds of faithful parishioners, young and old, have for hundreds of years pulled the chain of this bell with their mouths as a sign of joy. Recently, a new parish priest tried to abolish the practice, but the whole village rebelled and threatened to abandon the church. in southern Spain, it is usual to buy one's coffin well in advance of one's expected demise and to take part in a sort of dress rehearsal of one's own funeral. But although each person taking part maintains a horizontal immobility, playing the part to the death during the procession, once inside the church they rise to thank heaven for having preserved their lives. This church too is deconsecrated and no priest is present at the ceremony. Saturday morning at Sarsina in Apulia, the traditional affrontata takes place. The affrontata is a statue of the Virgin Mary which tries to escape from the affront of the exhortations of the populace who shout to make her take off her black dress because her son has risen. But the Virgin is doubtful. She dare not believe it yet. And whilst the crowd yells, she goes backwards and forwards in womanly uncertainty. But at last she is convinced and tears off her mourning to the thunderous applause of the crowd. during the days of Tai Pusan, the fakirs give stoic and choreographic exhibitions of their power. The more the body is pierced, tortured, wounded, humiliated, the more complete is man's victory over pain. The greater man's victory over pain, the greater his victory over the flesh. which leads to the nirvana of the Buddhists is a long road which must be traveled with bare feet. But nirvana is not paradise. It is a line beyond which all pain ceases. Pain, the only essence of life, and man, 
no longer suffering, no longer exists. By walking on fire, the Indian does not intend to make an exhibition of his pain, nor to offer it to the divinity. On the contrary, he wants to suffer no longer. That is to say, he no longer wants to be painfully alive because life is pain and it is man's duty to find the best way to rid himself of it. Saigon, where life is pain, is today more than ever tragically alive. When these scenes were filmed, this is the comment they inspired. In the deserted streets, there was an atmosphere of revolt that no crowd could ever express. The temples, which the army thought fit to destroy, have multiplied in these eloquent ruins which express mutely, terribly, the dismay of the 500 million Buddhists offended by this sacrilege. Everywhere, roadblocks and barbed wire, ridiculous in this solitude awaiting the shock of physical violence which everybody thought would never come because it is foreign to the nature of the people. From his picture high up on the wall, President Diem dominates and controls the deserted city. At the roadblock on Boulevard Pasteur, a notice in two languages informs the reporters that it is forbidden to take photographs and that offenders will be punished by martial law. which the government has only just recalled from the Mekong front, men of the police commandos in camouflaged overalls, control the streets leading to the United States Embassy where the authorities suspect two important Buddhist priests have taken refuge. The sentries have orders to stop and search all cars and to fire on any cars which refuse to stop. The fate of this city will be decided beyond this barrier of barbed wire. President Diem and Council Anu have assumed plenary powers. But in the war against the Buddhists, it is Madame Nu and she alone who commands. In the whole of Vietnam, the Buddhist priests suspected of belonging to the defense committee are arrested. These are incredible photographs. But even more incredible is the fact that after 2,500 years, with the foundation of this committee, Buddhism has contradicted the teachings of the master. To his disciples who asked him to become the head of their community, Buddha replied, let each of us obey his own conscience and seek no refuge but in himself. If the Buddhists have now abandoned this teaching and have risked the betrayal of the spirit of the master, there is only one explanation to offer. The meekest of men have been swept away by the blackest of despair.
Only in the prisons and the concentration camps, under the threat of the machine guns, they seem to have recovered their faith in the old doctrine. If you answer hate with hate, said Buddha, hate can never end. No longer do they fight in the streets. They squat and have their heads shaved as a sign of fellowship with their priests. From now on, they will oppose the steel helmets of Diem soldiers with their cropped heads. Many of them will enter monasteries to find once more their lost faith which teaches one to create silence within oneself and to listen to it. To kill all passion and desire within oneself and to enjoy the perfect happiness of a dying flame. The revolt of the Buddhists in Saigon had as a prelude the first public suicide which took place on May the 2nd, 1963, when the monk Chin Tien Dien, who with a terrible death that would have condemned him in the eyes of his master, tried to show that in order to fight every form of oppression on equal terms, Buddhism too needs its martyrs. Now that this, we hope, belongs to the past, it is time that everybody should obey his own conscience once more. superb and elegant, white and diaphanous as snowflakes. Dr. Livingston said, the Maasai, the Kikuyu, the Sumburu, the Watusi are all black-skinned, but they have white souls. Every evening at sunset, I see them fly over me and cover the sky with their archaic, infinite flight. White flamingos of Lake Magadi have lived here since time began. In all the African continent, they chose the shores of this lake for their nesting place. Then, two years ago, the English built a big soda factory which discharges tons of poisonous waste into the lake. 
the eggs go bad, and the fledglings, which do hatch, die after pitiful sufferings. The adults fly higher and higher in the African sky, until at last they disappear. Another strange aspect of the war which man has declared against birds from the time of his origins is offered by the Chinese of Singapore. The birds fighting in the cage are two whistling blackbirds which belong to the sparrow family and are nearing extinction. The sentiment which drives them to mortal combat is not, as one might imagine, a basic instinct, but a casual hate patiently nurtured by the trainer by a very simple method. For five weeks he keeps the two birds close together but in separate cages. And whilst one bird is fed abundantly and well, the other is starved. So it is obvious that in the final meeting between the two, no love is lost. And it is also obvious that the loser will be the weaker, undernourished bird. But the Chinese public doesn't care about that. It follows the fight with an interest which is anything but sporting. It waits for the great spectacle of death, which must be cruel and, above all, slow. It would seem impossible that one can make two small fish in an aquarium fight, but the Chinese can do it. They have found that a certain kind of fish from the paddy fields, the betta, if immersed in a solution of fermented camphor and water, become afflicted with a form of madness which makes them fight to the death. This form of entertainment is dedicated particularly to children who follow the struggle whilst they wait anxiously for the grand finale, which for centuries has sent the Chinese public of all ages into ecstasies, the triumph of death. Today, this public numbers more than 500 million. This aquarium is much bigger and so are the fish. But we're in America where everything is bigger. This is the pool at Marineland at Honolulu where a swimmer fights with the sharks. The performance begins with the sign of the cross and continues along the same lines. The sharks are all well fed so as not to lead them into temptation and the public follows all the phases of the fight anxiously, awaiting the grand finale which for centuries has sent the American public of all ages into ecstasies, the triumph of life. Today this public numbers a mere 300 million.
20 years ago, the El Bogo tribe numbered more than 2,000. Now there are only 50. They live in a single village on the eastern shore of Lake Victoria. Their country, as big as an Italian province, is arid and desolate. Their only food is the flesh of the crocodiles which they catch at the mouth of the river. It is quite plentiful meat and not really unpleasant. Only, if it is eaten every day for years and years, it kills the seed of life in the men. Today, just like yesterday and tomorrow, they eat crocodile meat at the village. The El Bogo, by now a resigned and sterile little tribe, have been condemned to extinction by a monotonous diet and endemic hunger. Only one child has been born in their village during the past 30 years, their last frail hope. and he is seven years old. Today is a great day for him. The fishermen have come back with a big fish, all for him. Because if he is to grow up big and strong and have lots of children when he is a man, he mustn't eat crocodile meat every day. It is one of those imperial carp which seem to be all gold. And it is the first one the fishermen have caught for years. It will last for a week or more. And no one will ask for even a taste of it. And yet Siba is unhappy a child all by himself, with no one with whom he can share the joy of such a wonderful fish. Everyone at the village follows his lonely games on the beach with anxiety. civilized world where we don't eat crocodile every day, sex has always been the biggest business ever. A detective story. Do you think it's sold for what's inside? Not on your life. It's sold for what's outside on the cover. This is a big photographer's studio in America which specializes in covers for thrillers. The recipe is always the same. Take one plump young woman, dice, and brown over a slow fire. While still rare, serve cold.
Today, slavery has been abolished throughout the world, wrote the late Secretary of the United Nations, Hammarskjöld. The infamous slave markets are now but a sad memory of bygone times. Sure, except this one. We found it at the risk of our lives between Aden and Mukalla on the Red Sea coast. These are Somali, Bangadi, Nanda and Kikuyu girls, all between the ages of 12 and 16. They fetch about $1,000 each. But before they grow old in the brothels of the Orient, they will have earned their masters 20 times as much. We are sorry to have to drag the United Nations into it again, but there is something we must add. We have the evidence of this British officer, Lieutenant Marlon Steele of the 37th Military Police District of Maridi. On the morning of May the 6th, 1963, five Kivu slave traders were arrested. They are guilty of having used these instruments of torture on 15 Bakudo children so as to reduce them to such a pitiful physical condition as to arouse the generosity of the passers-by. We are sorry and ashamed to have to insist on showing this terrible document. This young British officer who is collecting evidence is sorry and ashamed too, but it is his duty. Just as it is our duty and that of the whole civilized world, or the world that calls itself civilized and feels smugly at peace with its conscience and with God, 
to consider this an accusation to stop this cruelty. The human race uses such a lot of expressions like it's raining cats and dogs, gone to the dogs, dog tired, and especially a dog's life or mondo cane. So there must be some good reason for it. Just look at this poor dog, tied to the top of a pole under the burning sun of the dog days. Why is he there? He's there to make rain. The sacrifice the Nandi tribe of equatorial Africa offer to the rain god during droughts. of Africa which is always thirsty. In an area of more than 300 square miles, no rain falls for 11 months of the year. The few drops of dew which the humidity of the night lets fall onto the broad leaves of the jinguini are a treasure which these women collect with trembling hands. of a euphobia gives a few drops of sap. Tiny, slow-falling drops, as bitter as tears. But in Brussels, there's a wealth of water around the famous mannequin piece, a festival, in fact. They say that the girls who drink from the mannequins of tap will marry within the year and have at least eight children. Incontinent little fellow, isn't it? into the night at the Vespasien, the public urinal, a popular nightclub. with the exquisite good taste of the place, the strippers are wrapped up in colored toilet paper. The spirit of the mannequin feast reigns here in every drop of water that squirts from the soda siphons. The paper dissolves as the water goes gurgling down the closets. The allegory is complete. There's no allegory here. These are genuine, authentic cows, and this is a service station for them. Americans are practical people, and they couldn't care less if we Europeans are skeptical. For them, a cow is a machine for providing milk. With a little assistance, it provides its own replacement too. And so it should be kept well lubricated, washed and greased, as it were. They'd dress them in evening dress if they thought it would make them give a few more pints.
America has such faith in cows that last year she sent 300 to the territory of the El Molo tribe, a barren region in the heart of Africa on the southern shore of Lake Rudolph, where before cows were completely unknown. From a moral point of view, the action was certainly praiseworthy. But from a practical point of view, the American experts overlook the fact that although the cow too has a tail, it is not quite the same as a crocodile. It lives on grass. Last year, there were 300 strong, healthy young cows. Half of them have died of hunger. The survivors are obliged to eat the water weed which the poor El Molo gather from the bottom of the lake. prevents the cows from grazing in the lake, the women have the hard task of gathering leaf by leaf the wretched forage which this desolate land can offer. Another thankless job which was unknown before the cows arrived. Poor El Molo, they don't know that 500 sheep are on their way from Australia. Sukarno's natives have arranged something of the same kind in New Guinea. In obedience to the instructions of the United Nations organization to cultivate and develop the political sense of these indigenous tribes, especially on the eve of the elections, a newspaper is now distributed. It is rather like the business of the cows because these natives are illiterate. However, although at first sight it may seem over-optimistic to send a newspaper to people who can't read, even at election time, it must be said that all the political chatter written in New Guinea, in one way or another, does achieve its end. That of blowing a little smoke into the voters' eyes. Election time or not, every Sunday afternoon at Hyde Park Corner, there is a crowd of aspiring politicians who've all got some promises to make to the public in very flowing language. Ladies and gentlemen, flowers is what I'm here to talk about. Now every man should have his rose, every woman her jasmine, every boy his tulip. Transform the world into a garden, pull down your neighbor's houses and in their place plant flowers. Plant flowers of every color, large and small, bright and beautiful. Friends, and Londoners. But Hyde Park Corner has seen much worse in the course of its century as the theatre of London's casual politicians and cranks. I'm talking to you about the facts of life. Facts you never think of. Colour, for instance. You know and I know that there's no difference between black and white. But does the world? That is the question I want to answer today. Now, sir, are there many Negroes where you come from? Yeah. And have you noticed anything different about them? Well, of course there's a difference between black and For white. For you, why is there a difference? Maybe because I've got red hair. When an Englishman feels any form of political vocation budding within him, he comes here in search of an audience. It may consist of one fellow waiting for a bus, but he calls out to him and tries to thrust his particular brand of political panacea down his gullet. Usually the public shrugs its shoulders and walks away, but sometimes, even here, someone is taken seriously and ends up in Parliament. Listen to this one on the Profumo scandal. Oh! Miserable spillers, repent! Repent now, for the coming of the Lord is nigh. Have you bathed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you washed in the waters of Jordan? You are living in a world of iniquity. So repent now, for the hour of judgment is at hand. Turn from your evil ways. And I can only hope that one day a woman will be prime minister. Women have the patience to to make important. Wigglers, a high bar corner to seek for worldwide recognition of the third sex of Homo sapiens. Ah, there's one thing about that: we are certainly Homo, and often quite sapient, often more than so-called normal. 
Some say I'm a pansy. I'm positive. I'm positive that after we have conquered space, we shall conquer time with atomic bases. Atomic bases? Atomic bases, my sacred aunt. With the aid of the atomic bases, we shall be able to destroy time. Absolutely. Tempest fugits, time flies. It is improbable that a woman has time. Oh, time is the cause of our trouble. Flowers don't cause no trouble, as free the trouble time. As you know, I... Oh, no! Flowers will always help one. But not sinners. Not sinners! As is printed in this catalogue of blasphemy. Remember, flowers can be... Wait to salvation? Up the garden path. Politicians sometimes rise to great heights. Take Duke Harrison, for example. He finished his career 15 feet high. Every year at the beginning of summer, America relives at Tombstone the most glorious pages of the town's history. The most famous pioneers of modern democracy, like Jesse James, Billy the Kid, and so on, live, that is to say, die once more, where their famous duels were fought. pride of the men and above all the imitative spirit of the children are the miracle of this magic program. Although this year they've cut out some of the most celebrated lynchings of Negroes. The grand finale is always the moment for allegories. Tombstone is America where peace triumphs over violence. No one gets shot now, in Tombstone at least. Anyway, everything has been organized to perfection well in advance. They've coffins to suit all tastes and all pockets, from $100 up to $20,000. This shop in Los Angeles also sells by installments, and their slogan, Die Today, Pay Tomorrow, brings in an enormous amount of business. When a man reaches the average age for a heart attack, he goes to the undertakers with his future widow and chooses a casket. Actually, she always does the choosing, generally with a salesman who's about the same size as her future dear departed. are student undertakers, embalmers, and morticians at a university in California. These false human heads are made of rubber and synthetic resin, and they are all male heads. Here in America, women are immortal and aren't expected to die.
At only 94 years of age, Mrs. Agatha Connie Russell died unexpectedly at her home in Pasadena. This untimely death took everybody by surprise and no preparations had been made at all. However, thanks to the embalmer's art, Agatha is still sitting bolt upright in her chair, watching the guests having funereal fun. seems that Agatha is more tolerant than usual towards her husband who has been lifting his elbow a bit and lets himself go in certain demonstrations of affection that Agatha would never have permitted before. Whilst the cocktail wake drags slowly on at a funereal pace, the guests drink whiskey and tears in the correct proportions. One whiskey, one tear. side of the earth, what is there to be so happy about? Let's look each other in the eye. We've all had a hard year of it, and yet, can you believe it? Even the flimsiest excuse is enough for us all to be happy and gay all of a sudden. is that for 11 months we've had so many hard knocks that we'd like to take this opportunity to get our own back. Tomorrow the papers will say with their usual spate of catchphrases that people were a prey to mass hysteria. I ask you, mass hysteria indeed. This is a safety valve which lets off steam each year when the boiler is just about to burst. Tomorrow the papers will wail about some unfortunate accidents caused by the usual hooligans. Well, we are the hooligans. And do you know how many we are? Hundreds of thousands of millions. Ah, if only we had a flag. there are young men who show their virile exuberance in a legal and orderly manner. Whatever people may say, these are the famous Latin lovers of southern Italy. At midnight, they'll all be in bed like good little boys. The girls have already gone with the hens. which gives the countryside this rare atmosphere of calm, serenity. It is a Sunday morning in spring, and the quiet people of Vaturi, a little Sardinian village at the back of nowhere, 
go down to the main square for the festival of hard heads. Here in Sardinia, they say that the people of Vaturi have the hardest heads in this island of hard-headed people. The village is proud of this fact, which gives it a certain notoriety, and each year they hold a little competition which offers certain thrills. To avoid the regrettable fractures of last year, the participants are requested to have their heads examined at the surgery before using them. And now quiet, beginners please. against the wall of a supreme ideal and to break both your head and the wall is a manly gesture in which we believe and to which we give our wholehearted support. Heroic people of depressed and underdeveloped Southern Italy, come, sit down and dine at the Southern Italy Development Board. Anonymous crowd, you've broken your heads, but we're with you all the way. Yes, I uh, want uh, very much to be uh, an, an actor because the intellectual interpretation of a role is such a t difficult thing that perhaps I could somehow bring something new to the cinema. And uh, you know that new actors and new faces are needed all the time. I, I feel that my interpretation uh, could be a, a new face, and a new face means a new actor and a new interpretation. Uh, so I want to perpetrate my interpretation on this uh, silver screen and uh, be a w w worthy successor to uh, Rudolf v Valentino. Of course, you can't expect much more from a young would-be actor in southern Italy after the hard trial of the shop shutters. But anyway, this crowd in the south all wanted a screen test at all costs. And although we didn't have the pleasure of making a sensational discovery, we once more had confirmation of that singular tendency there is in these parts to bash one's head against something hard, like a shop shutter or a film camera. Lonely heart, take one. This life isn't worth living alone. Nobody to speak a kind word. Not a soul to call my own, with no one to help me, to be a companion. But I can't bear it, can't bear the burden of life alone. How often have I looked for a soulmate, for somebody who's suitable for me? I mean, a gentleman, a man who'll treat me like a lady, but I haven't found him. So what am I to do? Shut up and go away. No, no, more angry. Shut up and go away. Sarcastic. Ha, 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 shut up and go away. I can knock his block off. Come, come, more determination. I can knock his block off. Determination. I can knock his block off. Determination! 
I can have his block off. All right, calm then. I can have his block off. Take 22. Carlo, Vincenzo and Franco, my own friends, have taken me for a fool. Carlo has robbed me of all my property, house, car, even all my money. That devil Franco has robbed me of my wife, the woman I loved. Vampire, take two. After days of waiting, I succeeded in murdering Uncle Max. But now there's the corpse, how to get rid of it? To have it in here, the house isn't possible. Probably, it will begin to smell. And what have you got for us? A scene in the hospital with a dramatic ending. Where am I? My first vision is a hospital. What am I doing here? Oh, there are my friends. Franco, Arturo, Giovanni, Mario. What happened? Oh, yes, of course. Yesterday with the bus. Oh, yes. Now I remember everything. Yes. Oh, my legs. They've cut off my legs. And why do you want to be an actor? Oh, uh, uh, because I like to travel. Because I like women. Because I like money. And, uh, uh, and I wanted to be independent. Especially to travel around, to prove that I can, to prove that I have talent. Because I was made for acting, perhaps even for stardom. And my uh, wish to travel is because I want some new experiences. I want to find some blondes that are pretty, because it's stupid to stay here in Sicily. I'm tired of all the farmers, everyone out in the streets. Oh, purity's blessed dagger, cut open this heart of mine with your sharpest blade. Lord, who joined us in marriage before I gave myself to another, with this same blade I'll strike to my heart. Very good. And what's your party piece? Love in the station. Well, go ahead. Puna, I beg you, come back. I won't do it again, I promise. No. No. Stop the train. Stop the train, please. Thank you. Thank you, station master. She means a lot to me. That chosen by Achilles Tropulka, a Greek painter who is trying to make a name for himself in Paris, we find most unpleasant. Surrounded by a bogus setup that stinks of papier mache, the brave Achilles favors a style of painting which he calls stomatal painting. In spite of appearances, this doesn't mean that it makes you sick to your stomach, but mouth painting from the Greek stoma, a mouth. The terms he uses for the ingredients of this disgusting hogwash are just as original. The filthy mess which he obtains by mixing the colors in his mouth is called the master's divine vomit. These poor girls who prance to the canvas on which they spit the colors are stomatites. And the canvas is a stomata, which for clarity's sake doesn't mean a spittoon, but the surface which receives the spit stomatized by the stomatites. when the opus is finished, the master affixes his stomatal signature.
And here is another. He has just been commissioned to paint ten pictures to illustrate a new edition of Dante's Divine Comedy, and he's preparing his sketches in a suitable atmosphere. This time it's a more serious matter. This is the German artist Horst Semmering, who won the Gunter Prize for painting in 1953. Where's that sacred respect for the arts now? In these modern times, eight of the nine muses get a slap in the face every day. The ninth, music is still safe. Today, thank heavens, a concert is still a concert. Nobody's given music a slap in the face yet. an encore. Oh yes, we know very well that you should never give an encore. But when the public applaud and ask for more slaps, what can you do? I ask you, Mondo Cane, what can you do? You've just got to turn the other cheek. Respire. 